So just before I begin, um, thank you, Uncle Dean, for your welcome um, for all of us to be on this land um, and for me to return um, back to the land of the Durrumbul people as well after being away five, nearly six years. Um, I acknowledge the elders in the room and also everyone for making the time to come today. I know, um, you know, NAIDOC's been quite long and um, I was starting to feel a bit NAIDOC fatigue. I feel like I'm getting a flu and I think that's a little bit because I'm feeling a bit tired too. But I've had a great time. It's been a wonderful NAIDOC. Um, I need to make people aware that there will be photographs in my slide presentation and some of the photographs are of people who have passed so just to be aware of that, they are photographs that can be shown publicly, so just that you know that. There's also of photographs of people that are also here in the audience today um, and that have been taken over the last couple of months um, since I've commenced my, um, my new position here at the university. So um, just want to make you aware of that. They form part of the presentation. I haven't so much got a paper that I've prepared today. I'm going to talk to the slide presentation. And I'm, hopefully I'll incorporate the spirit of the, the tent embassy, but also that you feel that through all the slides and the photographs of that spirit, spirit of the tent embassy. And Melinda. So um, as Uncle Dean said, the theme for this year is 40 years on, the spirit of the tent embassy. And the 26th of January marked the 40-year point, actually 1 p.m. in the afternoon, roughly. Um, I love this photo because it represents all the contemporary images of us now as well. So that's the spirit of the Tent Embassy and 40 years on. So 1972 was the year that um, the Tent Embassy was established in January. And I want you to think about what were you doing at that point. People who were here um, at the NAIDOC breakfast, corporate breakfast, would remember that I raised that question at the corporate breakfast last week. And we heard, um, Justin here, you weren't even conceived in 1972. <laughs> um, we heard from Uncle Kevin Fraser that he got married in 1972. Um, we heard from John Kennedy from Catholic Education that he'd finished year 12 and that he was about to go to college. Um, we heard from Auntie Vivian that she was at home raising children. And we heard from Maureen um, Chamberlain that she was living in a caravan raising her children with no phone, no TV and no newspapers and really didn't know much about what was happening, even though her brother was down in Canberra as part of the Tent Embassy at that time. So a range of people were doing different things in 1972. People who were a little bit older than, than some of the others in the room, maybe think about what you were doing. I was a child. That photo on the right, uh, that young girl on the right, that's me in 1972, I was only in primary school. The little baby is my younger sister and the woman there with both of us is my mother. So in 1972, I was at school and I was at school at a place called Richlands East in Inala. So I'm an urban Aboriginal person. I was raised in the suburb of Inala with lots of other Aboriginal people, but also with lots of other people from very many um, ethnic backgrounds. Inala was a, you know, a, a suburb that was built totally basically on housing commission or army. And it was one of what they call a social experiment now, in terms of that, that period of time. 1972 in Rockhampton. So people who are from Rocky and have been here all the time, you'll know that Rex Pilbeen, um, who a lot of buildings are named after. I mean, they even put a statue about his horse, didn't they, in front of the, the gallery there, um, was the mayor at that time. Um, that's the first aerial photograph that was taken of the Rockhampton Hospital. And you can see that it's quite modern for that era. I mean, there was still building programs going on at the time. But, um, you know, there was a lot written about in the morning bulletin from 1972, when you go back over the archival material, about the Rockhampton Hospital and about the old and the new Lady Goodwin buildings. Um, the second set of traffic lights were installed and turned on in 1972. Um, you know, the, fifth, uh, the uh, population hit 50,000. The 50th citizen was born in Rockhampton in 1972. So 1970s in Rocky, early 1970s was a big deal. We also had um, possibly some of you wearing these crocheted uh, ponchos. And I see um, Professor Amy Zelmi here. Did you have a crocheted poncho? Yeah. Yes, she did. <laughs> she had a crocheted poncho. Um, it was Grease, the musical. Um, was launched on Broadway and interesting reported in the Australian newspapers and the local papers. 
Um, and the first time in 1972 we witnessed um, Joby Jockey Peterson, the Premier, along with Mr Iwasaki appearing in the newspaper roughly around this time in January, February, discussing a proposal for what became Ridges and is now Capricorn International Resort. Now you tell me, where would we be without Ridges? <laughs> and as I said um, at the breakfast, how many weddings have happened there? How many kisses in the spa and how many games of golf have been played on the golf course? Okay, because Riches has gone on to play a big part in this community's life in terms of a whole lot of things. We also had Senator Bonner, who ran for the ticket, for the Senate ticket in 1972, also from South East Queensland, a Yuggera man. We had Jermaine Greer on the 18th of January, just days before the young men went to Canberra, address the National Press Club on the 18th of January about um, how women were being portrayed in the media. Okay, she's still doing that today, going on about how women are portrayed and also how women portray themselves. Um, some of the lead songs were um, Candyman by Sammy Davis Jr. and Roberta Flack was also singing around that time as well. Um, Don McLean's um, Goodbye American Pie was also on the top three. And we had the campaign being rolled out and some who were in the audience today would remember that. The campaign called It's Time, Gough Whitlam who went on to also become the Prime Minister in 1972 in December. So 1972 was very, very... Sorry, just for a moment. Yes. It's the great leader's birthday today. Oh, is it? How old is he? 96. 96, yes. He's Sorry. still... That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I know for some people, irrespective of their political beliefs, that Goff has a special part, uh, part in their heart. Um, so getting to what happened on the 26th of January 1972 and as was stated by Uncle Dean there was four men who were fed up of a whole range of things. Number one, the day before the Aboriginal policy had been handed down by the McMahon government. In that policy there was very little that really addressed Aboriginal people's concerns. Uh, mining was allowed into Aboriginal reserves. The infant mortality rate at this, around that time was 17 times the national average. 17 times the national average. The Gurindji land claim had not been won. You know, it was lost. And a whole lot of other things were happening that they were really incensed and really impassioned and really quite angry and decided to do something about it. They travelled down to Canberra and they planted the beach umbrella. And their names, for people who can't quite see those names down there, is Billy Craigie, Bertie Williams, Michael Anderson and Tony Corey. They were the four men set up their beach umbrella with the signs. And people, and you'll see through, I want to make mention of the signs, because you'll see through all the slides that I show, the emphasis on these signs and how these signs over time also change. So the signs were really important at this time. They represented what the issues were, and then they went on to represent, and they have gone on to represent, the issues and the words change slightly around the emphasis. And I'll point that out as we go. So this was in 1972, January, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. <coughs> okay, you can see here them being, you know, asked by a police officer. This is very shortly afterwards. What are they doing there and are they going to move on or are they going to stay there? So this started the process in the January 1972. Very, very quickly, within weeks and within months, over 2,000 people arrived. Okay, with tents sleeping bags or whatever kind of stuff they had to put out to sleep and to have a shelter. It got started to get colder as well as the months, the weeks went by and the months went by. Think about what they might have even eaten. We look at the day-to-day -day reality stuff. You know, there was no instant two-minute noodles then. You think about that. There was no packet noodles. There was none of this sort of stuff that we have, Cryvact or anything then. They would have had to have little fires. They would have had to have cans of food, maybe biscuits maybe baked beans and spaghetti, maybe bread. You know, it's not like you could get whole meal or multigrain or all those fancy things then. But just think about those technical day-to-day -day stuff of just being part of that movement. And people arrived down there. You know, I mentioned Maureen Chamberlain earlier. Her brother Gary Foley was there. Um, Dennis Walker was there. Isabel Coe, Paul Coe. Um, Dennis Walker, Sam Watson. Lots of people ended up there and developed and grew in their leadership and stayed there for periods of time. 
Um, there was often, you know, raids by the police or police would come and try to break it up, take um, tents away, take people away. People would put them back again. They would get tents, more people would come. And this happened for some time. And it actually years went by. When you go over the archival material, you'll see that, wow, the, some of these people stayed there for years. And they were supported by their families. They were supported by their communities. They were supported by Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And I think it's important to say that at this point, that way back in the Tent Embassy when it was established, it wasn't just Aboriginal people. There were non-Aboriginal people there too, fighting for rights for Aboriginal people, fighting for equity, fighting for equality, fighting for a better future, fighting for recognition, and fighting for sovereignty. Okay, just moving up to 1982, you can see like 10 years later, people were still putting up tents. They'd get taken away or they'd get that age or something would happen and they would still put up more tents. That person on the right is actually Charles Perkins. So even though he was, you know, in government at the time and we had all through the archival materials, you will see quite prestigious or, you know, well-known figures, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, going down to that tent embassy site opposite the old parliament house on the lawns and being part of the tent embassy movement. So 10 years had gone by at this point. Um, anybody know why, why perhaps they called it the tent embassy or the Aboriginal embassy? Anyone in the audience? Come on, someone would know. Don't be afraid, talk up. Yes. Was it because Canberra had embassies for all of the other countries, but not for the people of Australia? Yep, Monica Moran, you're right. It's because um, there was embassies for all the other countries, and you could do a tour of the embassies. And people felt like at that time we weren't considered like citizens in 1972 or have enough rights or, you know, weren't recognised that we actually needed our own embassy. So when they set the, tent, set the tents up, and you'll see on those earlier footage it said Aboriginal Embassy and all the photos since will show Aboriginal Embassy um, on, those, on the tents and then on the buildings, the sort of semi-permanent buildings that, that later arrived in the 80s and the 90s. And I'm laughing because you'll see them soon. So um, you'll see um, this also reflects the 80s to see the furniture, the um, come in Dawn. You'll see the, the chair there, it's very reflective of the 80s. So all through the photos and the archival footage too, you'll actually see the you know, things that are sort of representative of the era. But people stayed there. People were there all the time. They slept there, they ate there, they had meetings there, they did business there. People gathered there. Okay, you can see perhaps this is quite, he's got quite a bit of clothing, it's probably cool. Also notice that sign. That's very 1980s, this whole thing around self-determination. And for people who've been around Aboriginal affairs for some time will know that in the 80s, under ATSIC, or DAA and then ATSIC, what did we have? Self-determination, self-management. So the signs also reflect all those things too around what was the policies of the day. Um, if you go to the embassy now, you'll still see remnants of these um, shipping containers. They arrived and you'll no also notice on the shipping containers that there's signage and paintings. They don't stay the same all the time. Sometimes there's parts that stay the same and they paint other parts. And on these ones, the, the woman on the left there, Isabel Coe, I have to mention her. Isabel Coe has been a long-standing um, person with the Tent Embassy and in fact she was a co-founder. In some of the literature you don't see her name or some of the names of the other women, you predominantly see men. But Isabel Coe has remained at that tent embassy since it was founded. She's still there. Okay? So just to, that you're aware of that. Um, and she has some bedding and things inside one of these um, shipping containers. But you can see over on the right, it says Stolen Children Debt Genocide. That one is actually from the period of time when we had the Stolen Generations report. Um, this one is an earlier photo, the one that has... The, the sort of landscape design on it, that was from, you know, the, the early 80s. I also have to say that um, they've also been subject to the public, not just the police, but the public in terms of being raided, where people have gone and they've been subject to arson attacks, and that shipping container was attacked by arsonists, not once, but it's been several times. 
um, and tents have been also burnt down. So we're not talking about someone who has a fire and then suddenly, you know, it's an accident and the tent catches on fire by the people that are residing there. We're talking about people who've gone there deliberately to cause harm to the people at the embassy. Okay? So it's all been subject to that as well. So you could imagine there's a whole lot of racial politics that have gone on behind that that have motivated people to do that. I also want to men make mention events. So since the embassy's been set up, and particularly probably in the last 10, 15 years, the number of events have grown. So there's been a wedding there. Um, there's been launches there. There's been gatherings there. Um, I saw Pam come in earlier. Pamela and I actually launched, a, um, Dr. Pamela Croft and I launched a postgraduate report there in 1998. It was not on Sorry Day, May 26, 1998. So that we're only two of many people that have been there to launch, you know, reports and documents and um, be part of the embassy. People go there, and as I said, notable people, esteemed people, as well as everyday people. So it's a gathering place. It's a place where people go to talk to one another, to meet up, to spend time to one, with one another. So it is a designated site. Um, it's now been um, what you call heritage listed. The site, it's not just a place that exists, you know, in limbo. It has been uh, heritage listed. Um, I will say that probably the last time, and I shared this at the corporate breakfast that I was there, was in November, um, late last year, when I travelled down for a national gathering of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with PhDs or doctorates. Um, and we were going to that meeting of 160 of us that have been found. Um, there was probably 120 at the meeting. But some of the people that I travelled with went down to the embassy to spend some time with people. And it's, not, it's, it's kind of really to go there and find out what people are doing, but also to go and say, well, how come we're there in Canberra and what's our business to be in Canberra? What might they need to know from what we're there about? You know? And so people contribute information to the, to the um, temp embassy. People also give money to those people that are there all the time and staying there at the embassy. Um, people can contribute a dollar a week even by you know, your your salary through automatic deduction to the tent embassy cooperative. So, you know, it's become quite a big thing now in terms of all of that and keeping it going probably forever, I don't know. You can see on the left there, um, the, the man up here um, is Chica Dixon, who passed not so long ago, I guess, but um, who still had that sort of sense of going to the embassy when he was in Canberra even from 1972. You can see the sign there says Aboriginal Tent Embassy, open all day, every day, come in. So, you know, encourages anybody to come in and go there and spend some time. I, I do want to make mention of the fire because there's always been fires there and people have had fires to keep warm to cook on, but in the um, 2000s it became part of a ceremonial process and they did have then a sacred fire. That's Isabel Coe there preparing the fire, and she's one of the keepers or the guardians of the fire. And you can see now that in a lot of the um, archival footage, there's also people standing around the fire, gathering around the fire, and doing some ceremony around the fire. So it's become kind of a contemporary place of ceremonial activity. And I, I want to make the point too, in terms of what we're saying about Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, or Indigenous and non-Indigenous people being together, the embassy has also supported other causes or other groups. And you'll see on the right side of this, it actually says Free East Timor. Part of the photo was cut off. I didn't have the whole photo. But on some of the other archival material, there's um, signs about a whole range of other issues aside Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who've been at that embassy have used the embassy also to raise awareness for other people in other parts of the world, or indeed other parts of Australia. Okay, very important. So that's in terms of the tent embassy 40 years on. Okay, we've moved to now 2012, where we're celebrating this year of NADOC, tent embassy, spirit of the tent embassy. Um, this, around 2012, there was lots of things leading up to what was going to be the 40th anniversary. And I don't know, people in this room might have, some people might have thought maybe I might go there. 
I know I got offered a, a, a ride on a link-up bus from Brisbane to Canberra, but I couldn't take that offer up. I know other people went down um, with other organisations or with family or clan groups or whatever to the tent embassy for January 2012 to participate in either corroboree or other activities that were happening on the tent embassy site or around Canberra. One of the things that did happen was a meeting of um, religious leaders and other and Aboriginal leaders in Canberra as well as the corroboree activity. This is part of the 2012 um, January celebrations earlier this year. You can see there's a lot of people there, right? A lot of people there. This is how the site currently looks. Anyone been to Canberra lately? Roger, you have? Go past there, have a look. Busy, yeah. Yep, it's probably, if it's most recently, it's pro possibly also because some of it's kind of maybe packed up a little bit because of winter. So um, the cold sort of probably gets into some people who are not used to it. But, you know, it is very busy this year. And that was on the 26th of January. And so, you know, we had, you know, Julie Gillard, Prime Minister's here today, but you would have all seen in the newspaper, you know, it was all the gefuffle around her shoe and all those things in January. I mean, why would you go to a meeting? I just can't under myself understand why they would have a meeting opposite the tent embassy, the old temp te uh, at the old tent embassy when they knew there would be thousands of people there and temperatures and, you know, temperament um, might be stirred up a little bit. And actually, if you go to the tent embassy site, there is a, they have their own website, you'll see photos of the blue shoe. They, someone had the shoe, obviously had the shoe. So there's all this stuff on there that actually portrays the whole, you know, day in, day out activities now of the tent embassy on the site. It's quite interesting in terms of people who are interested in social history, you know, as well as archival material. So 2012, 40 years since, and I ask you, what are you doing? You know, some people in this room here are still... Um, you know, fighting the good fight and trying to get things to be better for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. And some people here are still really concerned the fact that, you know, infant mortality is not 17 times the national average anymore, but it still is really a lot higher than mainstream Australia. Okay? People still aren't um, being educated in places like this university at the levels of other Australians. People aren't finishing school at the same levels as other Australians. We aren't buying houses or, you know, you can argue whether that's what we should do or not, um, and particularly on deeds of grant and trust, but people aren't having home ownership at the same levels as non-Indigenous Australians, you know. And if you ask people what their experiences of racism are, they will tell you they have experiences of racism in this very town. So 2012, those issues and those fights are still happening. People are still very impassioned with things that are going on. Things still aren't right. And, and from my perspective, in looking at the spirit of the tent embassy, I see that that spirit of the tent embassy still goes on. It's not so much like what Uncle Dean said about a place. It's about the spirit within the people. The place was one aspect of where it came together and which is a physical a symbol of what's happening. The spirit of the tent embassy really is about all of us. So really, it really is what's in us to make things better than they are. So in Rockhampton now, you know, we don't just have um, the second set of traffic lights. We've got lots to the point where I hear people whinging about how many there are on Lakes Creek Road or going from um, the corner of Fitzroy and uh, Yamber Road on the south side, you know, when you come through from the McDonald's and Coffee Club all the way out here to the uni, how many sets of traffic lights? From the roundabout to Bulls and Dream Time, 23 sets. 23 sets of traffic lights. Say a tourist deputy stop in Rocky. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. 23 sets of traffic lights from the Bulls to the Dream Time. <laughs> so there's lots. We also complain about, um, you know, having to move aside to let these big rigs get across with things for the mines. And interesting, when you go into the 1972 archive material about the morning bulletin, uh, the morning bulletin archives, you will still see, you will see in the 1972 archival material people complaining about foreign ownership and people concerned about mining, including the Port of Gladstone. If you open up the papers, probably and go over them for the whole week, you will see an article about mining and you'll see an article about the Port of Gladstone 
and you'll see people talking about foreign ownership of land. But foreign ownership still is today as it was then, which is the majority of land holdings in central Queensland in terms of foreign land ownership is by American interests and interests from the UK or European, British, Anglo-Saxon um, interests. It's not Asian influence. We now have a mayor, a female mayor, um, not elected once but twice. Um, Jermaine Greer is still espousing you know, and advocating for women. Um, we have a female prime minister who I said is here in Rockhampton today. We have a female um, local federal member. We still have people probably wearing, trying to get ponchos. Amy, I hope you've still got yours because <laughs> these days it would be called retro and vintage. And we've got people having 70s parties. So that's 2012 now, you know. I hear, you know, on the radio, the 70s and 80s music hour or whatever. So people sort of aspire to that time. But for us, in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait people, we can't go back there because we know that things were worse then than they are now. In terms of the spirit of the tent embassy now, I took this from the paper on Saturday. Look at these young people. They led the march way out in front. The proudness on their face and the cheering and the spirit is within them about what they want and their identities. When I opened up the paper and saw that, I was really, really proud to look at those photos on Saturday. And I also saw Rodney. This is Rodney's my partner. Um, grandson, Felix Stodder, was in the paper there with Whitney Warkill, his mother. So, you know, it was it, multi-generational presented in the paper on Saturday. I want to show some photos now of, while I've been here for the last three months in, my, in this new role, um, getting out and engaging and meeting with people in the community. And you look at the spirit in their faces. You look at people's faces. All these photographs are people who are out there in this community fighting for and trying to make change. That's the point I want to make, is that spirit is within people here. So on the left, you've got back on track. On the right there, you've got the Aboriginal Under Health Program, the Miss NAIDOC, we had when Kath Chamberlain visited as our first um, research seminar here, one of many. We'll be having many others. Um, on the right here, we had the group that met at the Sand Hill Studio to do the art exhibition for the Capricornia Arts Mob. Arnie Beatrice Henry, and I had a really great talk with Arnie Beatrice because, you know, she's just graduated from her degree program. So, you know, if I, I feel very motivated by her that if she can do it, all of you other mob here who are thinking about it, you can do it. You go and talk to her. Talk to her about, you know, she took seven years, but hey, she did it. She finished her degree program. Now she talked to me about, oh, I think I might want to do a doctoral program. I might want to do a PhD. Or some go for it, you know. Some other photos. I'm um, on this. I also want to make the, the point here where, where Margaret Hornigold's on the left at the buzz night. And I think you were there too, Roger. The buzz night that you now see Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people getting up at gigs together and talking about issues. In the 1970s, that was probably unheard of. We'd be probably quite rare, except at a church meeting. You know, you would rarely see a public meeting um, with politicians and other people where Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people would share the stage together. Nowadays, that's a common occurrence. The one on the right, Christine Malone here. You know. Her service is battling just to get funding, even though they've won awards. That shouldn't be happening. They're striving to get literacy levels to a point of where people can engage in employment and higher education. That struggle shouldn't still be happening just for basic funds for an award-winning service. Okay? They're fighting. They've still got that spirit of the tent embassy inside. And the bottom is, um, Justin, your co-workers, um, Justin is the acting CEO of CQID, the Central Queensland Indigenous Development and Corporation. Um, Bridget and I, we, we go out of Rockhampton too, and I'm making this point that we go out to represent the university and other organisations lobbying on behalf of the region. We also see people like the Vice-Chancellor and Deputy Vice-Chancellor attending NAIDOC events, coming to Indigenous events. It's no longer as it was in the 70s, just Father Hayes and Father Warby and maybe some good other you know, non-Indigenous people coming along. We see a whole range of people now using their influence and attending events and standing alongside us. 
Um, this is some photos I took in Bundaberg. So it's not just confined to Rockhampton either. Bundaberg people are out there doing stuff too. All other regions are out there doing activities and fighting and fighting the fight for the equity. This is Carol McPherson for people who don't know her on the right with me. Um, she's, she's from the university at the Noosa campus who participated in an event with me. And so I also want to make the point in this regard that we now have non-Indigenous people from the university acti actively starting to engage with us in community activities. We have the partnership with mining around the BMA scholarships that was announced in April. And um, Susie Blair and I, we had a great day. We went out only a actually a couple of weeks ago. We went out to Blackwater Mine and I met with the Aboriginal trainees out there but had a mine site visit. And I can say we will look more to having more partnership arrangements with BMA. Here we have some of the Allied Health staff who were up the back there. Um, so we had our meeting to look at what we were going to do. And then we went out, and they went out and did it. So they went to um, the Aboriginal and Islander Health Expo and held a store there with Nullayumba. So we're seeing not just, you know, the Aboriginal units going out doing activities, but the non-Indigenous staff from other areas of university or other areas of government as well participating in events with us. This is over on North Stradbroke Island, um, and that woman here with myself is Angela Barney Leach who came up to do the traditional welcome. She also works for Education Queensland and is currently the Director of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Education for this state. Um, we had a great time over there. We went there for the Writers' Workshop, for CQ University Writers' Workshop, but we also met with a lot of students who were over there looking at the Environmental Centre and studying biology. So now we've also got a mixture of people who are you know, traditional owners, people working in the education space, scholars, all working together in sort of that spirit of making things different. And I put this photo up specifically, these photos, because this gives us a bit of a glimpse of the future. It's now, but it also gives us a glimpse of the future. Some of you may know some of the people in those photos, other than myself. It was all taken on the same day. One on the left, up the top, Dr Odette Best. Okay, her mother is Ani Koi from Warabinda. Dr. Odette Best. On the right with me, Dr. Chelsea Bond. Okay, works in Anala, in community. Dr. Deb Duffy, social work doctorate from uh, Sherberg and the Northern Territory. She's currently teaching people and supporting people at QT. Dr. Mick Adams. Dr Mick Adams is the National Coordinator for the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Palliative Care Project. So specifically working with people around aged care and particularly community people. As people are living longer now, there are different issues around how to care for people, how to treat people, what are people's needs when they get to that point of needing palliative care. Soon to be Dr Melissa Walker, nurse has a degree in nursing, masters in midwifery and is also a nurse practitioner and soon to be Dr Melissa Walker. Some of you may know this smiley face. She won't be too far off, Melissa, in becoming Dr Patrice Harold. Yes, she's from Rockhampton. She's just finishing off her second master's degree. And if you know Patrice, she's worked in community all her life. Okay? So we're not talking about people who sit in universities and use their PhDs, we're now seeing a whole other flavour of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are going on to further education to work back in community, with community, with institutions, with um, government, um, and doing a whole range of things to bring about change. We also see at a national level <coughs> meetings of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with qualifications. We see Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, young and old, with elders and community members, planning activities, bringing all those skills together, all the skills together, to work to bring about change. We see here, some of you may have seen this photo, Shane Houston, Gungaloo man. He's actually Professor Shane Houston. 
myself and Professor Graham Smith, who was the first PVC Maori in New Zealand, roughly in 1999, who's now Vice-Chancellor. So we now see people at my level getting together, doing planning and making strategies happen. That photo was taken at the University of Sydney, Australia's oldest university. Photo on the right on the top was taken in Honolulu in April. You can see we're now also meeting internationally. It's people from communities are doing amazing stuff. Amazing things. The life expectancy gap still exists. And I will say between 2010 and 2012 that there's been a shift in how the calculations made. So it used to be roughly 17 years. It's now reduced to, depending what you read, it says 11. Some places say 12. But the issue for me and the issue for people who, you know, are fighting these fights is around that there still is a gap. There's still inequities. There's still problems around gaining health access um, and getting access to, you know, a whole range of services other than health services. We can also see, compared to other Indigenous people in the world, that we fare poorer. Okay? These other ones are the USA, for people who have a bit of trouble looking at that. USA, Canada and New Zealand. The darker colour are Indigenous people and the lighter colour are non-Indigenous people. So look at that for us in Australia. It's quite poor. So I say that the whole close the gap agenda um, needs more than a quick fix. And as we can see even from the tent embassy in the 40 years, and you said, Uncle Dean, you know, things have changed. We've had Reconciliation Australia. We've had, you know, the Stolen Generations Report. We've had um, the Sorry Day. We've had the walk across the Sydney Harbour Bridge. We've had the Sea of Hands. You know, we've had all these things to mark and try and be symbols to get people to do things. Things still need to be done. And I say to, you, to all you here today, things still need to be done. So in terms of this university, there's a couple of things that I'm charged with to do. And I see that, I want to try and see that we, and I say we because it extends beyond me, um, are to do. And to keep that spirit of the tent embassy within this that's been going all the time. And it's actually the spirit of us people. It's not the spirit of necessarily the place. And one is engagement. So it's engaging with people from inside this university outside. It's engaging people even inside the university to bring about change and do things inside the university. So we saw back earlier some slides where we had, you know, the Allied Health. There was a photo of us having the meeting. And then there was the photo of the Allied Health staff out in community, engaging with community in terms of the health expo. And now I see, uh, Monica, you've got a bag of tricks up there, don't you, for the widening participation activity. So that's now ongoing engagement. And I'm hoping that we get that sort of activity throughout the whole university, not just with one school or two schools or three schools, but right across all the schools. You know, it'll be a staged approach. It's going to take time. And we need to have more staff on board, both with me and with the schools. But over time, I think we can do that. The other thing is to look at students and how students are being supported and also staff, both Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander staff and also non-Indigenous staff, how we all work together, what we're all doing together, how the non-Indigenous staff actually need some support from us to do some things a little bit differently. You know? I used to get a bit, people who know me for a long time, I used to get a little bit wild, some of the non-Indigenous people, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now I kind of also understand that in some ways they need help from us to, you know, develop and grow their thinking and ways of working with us. Just can't happen like that. I'll also make the point here that we need good Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to work in this university. I think it's really sad that I come back here after so many years, and even as a student who graduated from here in 2003, and really there's no more Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander staff here than there used to be. You know, I feel really sad about that, either in Nullyumba or in the schools. You know, and despite having 406 ROS, these are 406 graduates we've had through this university, we don't seem to keep too many to be employed here. So it either says something about their employability, 
or the way they've been taught that they can't be employed, or it says something about employment here. So that's one of the things I want to look at too. We're going to recharge up and reinvigorate the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment strategy. We need to do that. We need to have some targeted employment to bring people in. And lastly, I've got their research. Um, the position I had before here was a predominantly research position. So one of the things I want to do is get research up here. And I know people have talked to me about doing research projects um, and got ideas for research. We need to, in some cases, put some ideas on hold and other ones we need to kind of have a strategic approach to how we go about doing those and looking for funding to get that research happening. So I put here what is to come and I guess for you it's to think about in this regard what are you going to do? Because you know, today I stand before you and we look at 40 years since the Tent Embassy and we look at the spirit of the Tent Embassy and as I've said, the spirit is in all of you. The spirit is in all of us. The spirit is not necessarily in the symbol of the place. That's the symbol of the place. The spirit is us to go about to make a difference. And that's the main thing I want to leave you with today is what difference are you going to make now? You know, what difference are you going to make for yourself, your family and this community? If you're from Rockhampton, if you're from somewhere else, your community there. If you're non-Indigenous, all Indigenous. What difference are you going to make? How are you going to enact that spirit of the Tent Embassy? And as we move forward into 40 years' time, I won't be here. Some of the other people in the room won't be here, but there'll certainly be people here in 2052. So in 40 years' time, what will you be thinking about in terms of the 80 years since the Tent Embassy? And what will have you contributed? Yeah. What will have you contributed? So I want you to take that away today. All right, thank you very much. Questions? Might just take a couple of questions and then we'll finish up for lunch. I know people might be getting hungry. Yes? As a non Indigenous person, what are some of the things that you can do to try and help communities? What are some of the non things non Indigenous people can do? Number one, take responsibility for yourself. I often get people asking me, oh, what can I do? Uh, what about this? They asked, like the other day someone asked me, what does the Aboriginal flag mean? And I'm like, if you don't know as a 40-something-year-old person, what does the Aboriginal flag mean? And you're asking me, that's a problem. For some non-Indigenous people, they need to go and read. They need to look up Google. If you can, people can look up Google and Facebook about other things, about where to eat dinner, where to order a pizza, where to get dry cleaning in this town or whatever. They can look up what does the Aboriginal flag mean. They can look up some history. So I think first and foremost... It's about taking responsibility to educate oneself about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. And then from there, joining groups. You know, I'm not sure if there's an ANTA group here. In other places, there's a Australians for Native Title and Reconciliation group. Um, attend Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander events and support events. Maybe become a volunteer at some groups. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff. If you hear family members or community members say derogatory things, challenge them. You know, Maggie Walter proved, Maggie Walter is a Palawa Tasmanian Aboriginal woman, proved that most non-Indigenous people make their minds up about Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people through reading the newspaper and the media, like the TV. They actually don't tend to live next to an Aboriginal person. They may not have an Aboriginal person even married into their family. So mostly they know about Aboriginal people through the media and mostly we know the media beefs stuff up and doesn't exactly portray us in a very well light. So, you know, there's a range of things that you could do there. Anyone else? Narelle, are you thinking of one? Well, like Dean and I are both delegates to the National Congress of Australia's First Week. I also am with the Justice Working Group as the Dean. And, yeah, we've got. Yep. 
Yeah, so Narelle's just raising um, about the Congress of um, National First Peoples um, and around that fight that continues. And that's a, a big national group now. It's got a lot of members across the country. We need more. Need more. Um, and um, there is an election process of people to get representatives on that group. I wonder who's doing too after I Yeah. I'm a member. So any more questions and then we might break. Okay, thank you very much everybody for coming and I want to say also thank you for the people, um, Roz and, and um, Amanda and others who decorated um, the, the, the room today. It looks fantastic. Um, it's a real pleasure standing in here and having everybody together. So thank you for all coming as well. Thank you.